Good afternoon and welcome to the first of our spring 2018 John Jay Research Book Talks featuring John Jay's own Amy Adamczyk and her 2017 book Cross National Public Opinion about Homosexuality Examining Attitudes Across the Globe. Uh, I'm Dan Stageman, I'm the Director of Research at the college, and uh, this is our 24th talk since we inaugurated our book talk series in the spring of 2013, so a venerable tradition. Thanks for being a part of it. Uh, Professor Adamczyk is going to be joined today by two guest <coughs> discussants, Dr. Brian Powell and Dr. Ryan Thorson. Pronounce that correctly, Ryan? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, just some quick biographical information on our presenters. Dr. Adamczyk is professor of sociology here at John Jay and at the CUNY Graduate Center. Her research focuses on how different contexts and personal religious beliefs shape people's attitudes and behaviors. Her work has been published in numerous outlets, including the American Sociological Review and supported by foundations, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, Dr. Brian Powell is James H. Rudy Professor and Co-Director of the Preparing Future Faculty Program at, in the Department of Sociology at Indiana University. His award-winning book, Counted Out, Same-Sex Relations and Americans' Definition of the Family, documented the transformation in how Americans define family and in turn their views regarding same-sex families. And Dr. Ryan Thorson is an adjunct professor here at John Jay College and a researcher in the LGBT rights program at Human Rights Watch. His book, Transnational LGBT Activism, Working for Sexual Rights Worldwide, argues that LGBT human rights are defined by international activists who establish what and who qualifies for protection. His latest report for Human Rights Watch is All We Want is Equality, Religious Exemptions, and the Discrimination Against LGBT People in the United States. So if you'll welcome our guests and presenters, and thank you for joining us for this important topic today. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming to this, and I want to thank the Office for the Advancement of Research for allowing me to do this. It's really exciting uh, to be here to talk about this work and to see so many people in the audience. I have a couple of just very brief announcements I just want to let you know about. Um, first off, um, one of my undergraduate students, Bosco, who's sitting over here, uh, he's helping us run a raffle today. So if there are any students in the audience and you have not yet gotten a raffle ticket, please see Bosco. We're going to raffle off 10 copies of the book, which is it's great. Uh, secondly. Um, um, if, are there any students here from Michelle Holder's class? Yeah, before you guys go, make sure you see uh, Bosco again. He's going to take your name and he'll be sure to let your instructor know that you've attended and uh, that you've asked lots of questions. So, yeah. And then um, finally, uh, we're going to raffle off 10 copies of the book, but we, I do have some copies here for you to purchase, uh, $25 a piece, that's with my author's discount, and again, Bosco's going to be in charge of that, so feel free to do so. You can also probably get them on Amazon or Barnes & Noble a little bit cheaper, so that's okay too. Um, so, the, can you, I'm trying to make sure I can. Okay. So the, the book is a uh, multi-method investigation into cross-national public opinion about homosexuality. It includes a lot of information and includes a number of different research techniques, including a very large statistical uh, analysis of 87 nations, uh, a content analysis of over 800 newspaper articles, a comparative case studies of several nations, and then finally some research done while I was in uh, Taiwan for a number of months talking with various individuals. So it's completely multi-method, which I, I think is, is exciting. Um, but just to lay the context a little bit for why I'm examining this issue, across the globe, there are major differences in how people view public opinion about homosexuality. So as some of you may know, in Europe, North America, and South America, attitudes about LGBTQ individuals are really quite liberal, uh, with uh, you know, less than 50% of people saying that homosexuality is never justified. But when you move into other parts of the world, things change quite radically. So for example, if you were to go into Africa, Africa, the Middle East, and various parts of Asia, um, close to 90% of people will say that homosexuality is never justified. So there are massive differences in how people are viewing uh, this important public opinion issue. 
Now, the public opinion is important in part because public opinion is closely related to laws. Often public opinion proceeds, pre precedes the laws, although in some cases it may come after the laws. And if you were to look at the relationship between uh, public opinion and the laws, you'll see a really quite high correlation between the two of them. So I'm presenting to you here a map of the world. And as you can see, in North America, South America, and parts of Europe, um, many of these places, many of these countries, allow for same-sex uh, relationships um, a marriage laws have been put in effect, uh, or laws very close to that. If you were to go into the Middle East or into Africa, things change drastically. And it's here where you'll start to see that not only may homosexuality be illegal, uh, but uh, th there can be death, actually, for homosexual acts. And so this, this is really interesting, and I think it hopefully illustrates just how big the divide is across the world on this important issue. Now, just as uh, the laws and public opinion across the globe have very, very substantially, within individual nations, things have changed a lot. And uh, we're experiencing some of those changes in that in the United States, public opinion has become drastically more liberal in a relatively short period of time. So if you were, were to look back into the 1970s, you'll see about 10% of people say that homosexual relations are not wrong. But by the time you get into 2009, 2011, and certainly up to to today, you're pushing 40 to 50% of people will say that they are not wrong. And this is just a massive shift. And it's a massive shift that is largely occurring all within a similar time period. So it's not that older individuals are necessarily dying out, being replaced by younger individuals, um, although there is some of that. But everybody is changing. So you changed, grandma changed, mom and dad changed, the baby changed. Everybody changed their attitudes in a relatively uh, short period. And relatedly, if you were to look at the media, and I know some of the um, uh, more mature individuals in the room may remember um, how different things used to be. Uh, in 1997, Ellen DeGeneres was uh, one of the celebrities that came out as gay, and it was a really big deal when she did it. She got this big time cover splash, and here she is, and um, unfortunately, her sitcom was canceled the very next year. So, um, you know, there was still a lot of um, debate and, and a lot of um, uh, disapproval when she was coming out, and it was quite a big deal. Um, the year after her sitcom ended, uh, Will and Grace came on there, uh, onto television, and this became a very popular sitcom. It's so popular, it's actually back today. And then, of course, by the time we get to the uh, 2010s, um, this is a picture of Anderson Cooper, and he came out in 2012, and I think the mentality for a lot of people was simply, who cares? Why is this important anymore? And it certainly didn't garner the same amount of attention that Ellen DeGeneres did when she first came out in 1997. Now, while things in the United States have changed you know, rapidly, um, it's not that way everywhere else. And I, I think it's important that we never forget that. Um, it's a very different climate here in the United States than it, it is in other places. So in, in, uh, in Uganda, things are very different. Um, in 2010, uh, Rolling Stone uh, newspaper, which is one of, one of their local newspapers, um, published the names and addresses and pictures of 100 people that they said were um, homosexual. And, uh, this is particularly a problem because in Uganda, um, uh, LGBTQ relationships, it's, it's illegal. Same-sex relationships are illegal, and you can be really quite partially punished. So when this came out, um, it, it was very difficult for the individuals who had been named. Um, and I'm, I have a picture here of David Cato, who was an activist. And he was killed shortly after this because somebody came to his home. And we don't know for sure, but a lot of people have suggested that it might have been because of um, th this information being leaked about him. And so with Things are just very different in uh, you know other parts of the world. Now, my book is trying to unravel why things are so different, and I spend the first couple of chapters of the book going over this very large cross-national analysis of public opinion data. And the goal in me doing that is to try to understand why are things so different across these nations. Um, the, the survey data includes, as I mentioned earlier, 87 nations um, with over 200,000 people, and it captures about 90% of the world's population. So it's, it's very highly representative, um, and I, I hope and I think provides a lot of insight into why things vary so substantially. 
So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the statistical analysis, uh, but before going there, I wanna clarify something, which is the, part of the name of the book, and what I'm, I refer to a lot, is, is this term homosexuality. And homosexuality is very much, it's a term that has been changing. Uh, I, I wonder if in a handful of years we may no longer use it. Uh, it's very historically and socially dependent, um, and new terms keep coming up. So why do I keep using it? If it, it sounds a little clinical, and it is getting a bit antiquated. Well, first off, um, I want to clarify, there is very little data that actually gives us much insight into cross-national public opinion about homosexuality across many, many nations. And the data that I use asks specifically about homosexuality. There's some good reasons for that, um, and, and I can go into more of that uh, in the Q&A, but it is the term that they use in all of their surveys. In part, that's why I'm using it too. Um, but I do want to clarify, we don't actually know what respondents mean by this term. We don't know if they're referring to behavior, individuals, identity, uh, desire, so forth. It's a little bit unclear. All we know is they were asked about their feelings about homosexuality. Uh, secondly, um, when we go into other nations, this is a term that comes up repeatedly. It's the most popular term when we, when we did our newspaper analysis. And so it seems to be a term that people are very much using. And at least so far in the United States, we haven't found yet that when we switch out the term homosexuality with same-sex relationship, that people feel particularly more negative about homosexuality. So for a variety of reasons, I'm continuing to use the term. But like I say, I do understand that the times are changing, and I'm not sure this is going to um, be relevant. Uh, if I ever do another edition of the book, we might be calling it something else. Okay, so one of the things that my book is able to unravel, and I'm not actually the first person to unravel this, but I think it is important, and that is to try to understand better what are the individual characteristics that are shaping attitudes about homosexuality. Now, I think many of you know what some of those characteristics might be. They include things like religion, gender, age, income, education, and marital status. And um, the interesting thing about these characteristics is that they're fairly constant in, across nations. So for example, in the United States, on average, we're going to be talking a lot about averages, um, women tend to be more liberal than men on this issue. Um, if you were to go to Japan, you'll find women on average tend to be more liberal than men. If you go to Egypt, you're going to find this similar relationship. And so there's, um, th these are characteristics that are relatively constant across nations, and they're, they're very interesting, but they actually don't do that much to explain cross-national public opinion about homosexuality. If you really want to look at national level differences, you might want to consider Consider, and certainly my book does, um, what are the differences between nations? Is there something going on within the larger culture or structure that might be shaping how people view this important issue? So, um, I spend a lot of time in my book, in the first couple of chapters, trying to unravel what those country level influences uh, might be. And I examine over 70 different characteristics, and I tried to go through and think through um, all of the uh, you know, potential empirical relationships, but also the theoretical relationships. Why would something like gender inequality matter for shaping people's views about LGBTQ individuals? And what I found is that it, despite all of these different factors, it could largely be boiled down to just these three, which is democracy, economic development, and the religious context of the nation. Um, it's not that these other factors are not important, and they're certainly important within individual nations, um, but if, when you look across a whole broad range of countries, it's democracy, economic development, and the religious context of a nation that seem to matter more than these other things. And in the q and I can certainly unpack that in my book, spend a lot of time unpacking why, for example, something like gender inequality doesn't matter, um, whereas other things like democracy you do. So, okay, what's going on with these relationships? Well, first off, this is just a very simple scatter plot of the relationship between GDP, it's how rich or poor a country is, um, and uh, a, a disapproval of homosexuality. And you can see right away, nations like Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands, these are rich countries. There are also um, very few propor proportion of people disapprove of homosexuality. If you go up, to the, uh, go up to Egypt, Uganda, Indonesia, these are relatively poor nations, and uh, high proportion of people disapprove of homosexuality. 
Now, this is just a scatter plot when you look across nations, but um, in the book, I spend a lot of time unpacking both the theoretical relationship between these things and also the empirical relationship. And there's no doubt that richer nations, uh, if you live in a richer nation, you tend, on average, to be more supportive of LGBTQ individuals than people from poorer nations. And I just want to clarify, that's an effect that goes beyond how much money you personally make or how much education you personally have. There's something going on in the large your culture that shapes how you're viewing this issue. Um, similarly, if you were to look across um, different forms of government, um, you will inevitably find that people coming from democratic nations tend to be more supportive of individuals and same, same, in, in, tend to be more supportive of LGBTQ individuals. Um, and again, in the book, I spent a lot of time unpacking the theoretical and the empirical linkages um, between those two things. But again, this doesn't matter. This is over and above how educated you are or how much money you make or whether or not you're a man or a woman or or you're religious or not, this is over and above that. So there's very much something about living in a democracy that she seems to be shaping individuals' attitudes about homosexuality. And then finally, um, you, some of you may, uh, could maybe anticipate this relationship. Um, regardless of your own personal religious beliefs, regardless of whether or not you're Catholic or you're Muslim, if you are living in a country that has a high proportion of Muslims, on average, individuals tend to be more opposed to homosexuality than individuals living, for example, in a Catholic country. Um, and my book spends a lot of time talking about Catholic nations and Muslim nations. And um, there's a lot in there that sort of unpacks what is going on with regards to the dominant religion within these places. OK, so that gives you a little bit of information about what is occurring in those first few chapters where I go through this heavy statistical analysis and try to unravel what are these key relationships. The remainder of the book then spends time unpacking these key relationships. And the last two chapters um, focus on East Asia. Um, East Asia is a very fascinating place. Um, it presented me with a bit of a conundrum. Um, I was curious about how the Confucian nations felt about LGBTQ individuals, and as you can see here, in this analysis anyway, um, their views about homosexuality are as negative as many people living in Africa. And so the question is, why is that? Because many of the Confucian nations, and they think here Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, um, they're relatively rich countries, okay? They're not, they're not super poor, as, as you might find in um, you know, various parts of Africa. Uh, many of them are democratic, not all of them, but many of them are, um, and they're not heavily Protestant or Muslim. So what is happening here? This was an important question for me, and it actually took me to Taiwan, where I ended up doing uh, several months worth of field work um, talking with uh, claims makers. These were academics, religious officials, reporters, politicians, uh, various people who would have had something to say about LGBTQ individuals and would have had a stake in, in kind of what the public's view was on both the left and the right, so both conservative and liberal. And I'll tell you a little bit about my key findings in Taiwan. I, I mean, it was, it was very heartening. Uh, very, it, was, it was lovely when I was there, because right away people would say, OK, Amy, let me tell you what's going on here. And so we very quickly found out some answers that, to me, um, I guess should have been obvious, but weren't obvious before I went there. Well, first off, interesting thing about ta Taiwan, and I, I would say many of the Confucian nations, there's a very strong desire for a traditional family structure. So despite the fact that um, divorce rates are definitely increasing, if you look at people's attitudes about divorce, it's not approving. Um, and so there's this, this strong interest in having a traditional family structure. Relatedly, um, Taiwan has some of the lowest rates, the, the lowest fertility rates in the world, and many of the other Confucian countries are very, very close. And this is, was a big concern for a lot of people in talking about homosexuality, because they would say, well, I guess I don't mind if two guys want to you know, hang out together, do, do whatever it is they're going to do, but at the end of the day, are they going to make a baby? Because that's really what we need. We have such low fertility fertility rates. And I, of course, coming from America, would say something like, well, you could just adopt. And, and they would say, oh, no, 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 we, we don't really do that here. And that was an important aspect of this, is that the rates of adoption were very low. And this idea that you would go out and, and take care of someone else's kid, or um, you're, gonna, you're going to adopt, in some ways, it, uh, it, would, it was viewed as sort of messing up the blood, blood lines. And there was the con these concerns about ancestral worship, and what are you going to do when you die? Who's going to, you 
you know, pray for you and, 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 and remember you. And, and that had to be connected via bloodlines. There were a few other things that were going on. Um, at the time, things are changing a lot in Taiwan. It's, it's actually a very exciting place um, right now with regards to LGBTQ rights. Um, but when I was there a handful of years ago, at that point, many people still hadn't come out. And so in the United States, we, we've had, a, I, I would say, a really amazing coming out movement. And it's really hard to discriminate and be prejudiced against somebody if, if, if they're your friend and you find out they're gay. Um, that kind of idea, that contact hypothesis that, oh, you do know somebody who's LGBTQ, um, it, it does contribute to tolerance. And I would say it's, it's had been an important factor in the United States for contributing to tolerance. Um, but if nobody ever comes out and you don't know that your best friend is gay or that you're cousin is or whatever, it's harder, I think, for people to understand um, what, what is this thing? What are you referring to? How do you understand it? And then finally, um, in, when I was in Taiwan, very interesting things that were happening, but there was a very strong counter movement driven by conservative Christian groups. And so that was something I spent a lot of time talking to people about. Um, in, in Taiwan, less than 10% of people are Christian, so this was fascinating to me, like, what is going on? Um, but they, they had a strong movement, and my book tries to unpack um, some of what they were doing there and their contributions. Um, before I end, I just want to say something about you know, where the future might go. Uh, so uh, two interesting things are happening. On the one hand, we've had um, uh, nations increasingly li uh, uh, end their tacit bans on same-sex relationships. At the same time, we've had more and more countries enact constitutional or legal bans, right? So in 1996, there were only 11 countries that had a constitutional or legal ban. By 2013, it was up to 27. So there's two things going on here. I do think the world is becoming more tolerant, but it's not moving um, in a straight line. It's, it's jumping around, and um, I think it's going to be complicated as we continue to move forward. Um, my book does talk about why is there this little bit of black backlash going on. I think this backlash makes sense. I think a lot of nations are a little tired of being pushed around by richer countries, including the United States and the United Nations, and they've been pushing back, and this is one of the things that they can do to push back um, that doesn't actually cost them that much, although sometimes it does, and then they, they change things. Um, so I do think that there's reason to be really positive about where um, we're going to be going in the future, but it's not going to be simple, it's not going to be linear, and it's going to be with a lot of these jumps where some places get more liberal, others get more conservative, but maybe they'll eventually come back around. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my uh, two commentators. These... Um Discussions about books usually fall into one of two categories, um, a love fest or a really vicious attack on the book. Um, it's not going to be the latter, and it's going to be mostly a love fest because this is a really important and I, I, you know, and I think a transformative book, and uh, a book that um, you should sign, buy for or sign up for the raffle as soon as you can on that. Um, the, the book... Um, is important. Wait, why is this not working here? Nope. There. Uh, the book is important for many reasons, but I want to focus on four issues that the book, I think, makes very important contributions and makes us think more about. Um, the first one is, and it may not be that surprising to people in this room, but the study of sexuality and the study of LGBT issues is a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, I can think back to graduate school days, and let me just assure you, people did not talk about sexuality. That was not part of sociology. That was not part of social science research. There were a few professors who were, quote, doing what people refer to as the dirty work of studying a sexuality, but it really wasn't. The revolutionary thing was to study race and sex. And that's, it, you know, just tells you where we are in terms of today. Um, but even though there's been a great deal of change in terms of the study of sexuality, there have been very few, st there still have been, I, 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 sexuality studies still remains more marginalized than many other areas. And I think one of the important contributions of this book is really pushing the study of sexuality to a broader audience, and I'm going to use the term which sometimes people use pejoratively, mainstream scholarship. And this, I think, is a really important contribution regarding this book. 
A second key contribution regarding the book is the focus on public opinion. And again, the question of public opinion, many people would think, if I talk to most people outside of academia, they say, yeah, public opinion, of course it's important. Of course it's important to understand what people think. And I know there's at least one professor in this audience who studies public opinion who absolutely would agree with that. But in the social sciences, there still remains this big debate out there. Why study public opinion? Public opinion may or may not be that important. I take the vantage point from so of somebody who's been studying public opinion for a couple of decades and who believes that public opinion is important. At minimum, it is reflective of where we are. But as, a as Professor Ad Adamczyk points out, it also can be a precursor to social change. That public opinion, it is very difficult, it's more difficult for change to occur if the public is not behind it. Or to put it in a different way, it is not coincidental that the legal changes regarding same-sex marriage was occur were occurring precisely at the point that public opinion regarding same-sex marriage was becoming much more liberal. It is not a coincidence that, that, that President Obama evolved precisely as American public opinion was evolving. Public opinion can shape legislation. Public opinion can shape change. Public opinion can be behind court, at least partially behind court decisions. That doesn't mean public opinion always does work that way. And in fact, public opinion is not the same as voting behavior, and we know that. We know that if you look at public opinion and then you look at voting, you see a discrepancy. It could be people are not telling you the truth, but the more reasonable explanation is that public opinion typically is studied in terms of a national representative sample, whereas voting is not a nationally representative sample. Voting is a question of who votes. And what do we know? We know that people who are older are much more likely to vote than people who are younger. Um, I did some, I played with some numbers today and I was just looking at the voting behavior in uh, the voting patterns in 2016 in the, you know, the last election. In the last election, 70, according to some figures, um, about 70, 71% of adults 65 and above vote, who were eligible to vote, voted. The figure for people under the age of 29 who were eligible was less than 50%. I did some calculations on it and if, if people who are under the age of 29 actually did vote, their patterns, there would have been, at the same rate as people who were 65 and above, there would have been 11 million more votes. And if you think about how thin the difference in elections were in a few states, electoral states, that would have been a big difference. My point is not to say that younger people should vote more or older people should vote less, but rather that public opinion and voting may not necessarily correspond. The other point, though, that's pointed out by Professor Damsek is public opinion does, may operate differently in different countries. So public opinion in a more democratic country may be more influential than in countries that are less democratic. So those are some key points that I think were important regarding public opinion. The third important contribution of this book is it's focused on in, it's, it's, its international scholarship. Uh, Professor Damsek is one of the first to focus on international variation in attitudes regarding sexuality. And all too often we have a pretty cultural myopic, myopic view uh, regarding what's important. And I, I will confess to being one of those people who most of my work is about the United States. Um, there is a book that just came out by uh, um, Mitchell Stevens, Cynthia Miller Idris, uh, and Centenia Shama that basically called Seeing the World, How U.S. Universities Make Knowledge in a Global Era. And they point out, in effect, that economics, sociology, and political science, in their words, have remained stubbornly parochial by focusing on the United States. Professor Damsek makes a very important contribution by forcing us, compelling us, to go beyond the lens of the United States. 
And by looking at other countries, we can understand the patterns of the United States a great, a great more, a great, uh, much more. I was going to talk a little bit about some of the core patterns within, um, you know, within the book. I, I think Professor Danzig did a really nice job explaining all that. I do want to make one observation uh, regarding these patterns, though, um, and that is. When we think about countries, we also have to recognize, and she notes, variations within countries. I'm just going to point out within the United States, within the United States, um, I, I'm, I'm from Indiana, and I will tell you, Indiana is a different country than New York. Absolutely a different country. And if you look at support, regarding LGBT issues, for example, support for same-sex marriage, or, or the view about the justifiability or, you know, of, 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 um, of being LGBT, you find great differences. And I did some analysis just to play around earlier today, and I was looking at the patterns in different states, and what we see is a core of states, in particular Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, South Carolina, and West Virginia, the patterns in those states are very similar in terms of support regarding LGBT issues to Eastern European countries, which have typically have not been particularly receptive to it. So although we can talk about the United States being a particularly liberal country, we're really talking about there is a great deal of geographical unevenness regarding, regarding it. That said, in terms of the inter, and so I would be really interested about a little bit more knowing about the variations in certain countries, and I suspect the variations are less great in other countries. You do point that out in terms of some of the issues about urban-rural differences. The next contribution, and I think this is, uh, this is something that my views have shifted a great deal in the past decade, is the importance of what's known as mixed methods. Many people in graduate school are, were, were basically trained to learn one method. You become a quantitative methodologist, or you become an ethnographer, or you do interviews. And there's this, sort of this idea that's promoted by many people. You need to become an expert in one thing, and it's very, very difficult to become an expert in more than one. As, and that may or may not be true, but as a result of that type of philosophy, we typically see research that is informed by only one type of methodology. You know, so we see research that's mostly quantitative analysis of surveys, or we see some beautiful but still limited interviews of 20 people who live in a certain area, or people who spend a year, let's say, in Taiwan. What Professor Damsik does, though, is try to marry these all together. So we see quantitative research. We see content analysis of text. We see interviews and ethnographic work all into one. And we see the importance of how those things, why, and we see how those things are merged together. Now, I think this is, from my own experience, I think this is really important. Because as someone who for many years relied solely on survey data that was collected and I just type it in the computer and analyze data, it was a real surprise when I started doing research, uh, collecting my own data, survey data. Huh. I think that's sort of telling me I should finish up soon. Huh. Okay. There. Um, I was really surprised when we started collecting our own survey data, and I was looking at the data before I just saw the numbers coming out. We found that even when we have, quote, simple questions, people often are going to give utterances, unsolicited utterances, telling you, giving you a great deal of information that you wouldn't have seen by just looking at the numbers. Let me give you one illustration that's pertinent here. We asked in our surveys, it was a national sample in 2003, 2006, 2010, and 2015, do they identify as gay or lesbian, bisexual, or heterosexual? And we found out that there was a consistently noticeable, probably around 5% number of people who could not answer the question. It wasn't they couldn't answer the question because they were debating the issues of identity and behavior and, you know, and anything like that. No, it's that they did not understand the term heterosexual, period. And they were heterosexuals. Uh, let me give you a couple of quotes. Um, 
I'm a woman married to a man, so that makes me bisexual. Another person said, I'm Italian. I like women, whatever that means. You know, one of the most common responses was the variation on uh, whichever one is, quote, normal. Now, the thing about that is we would not have known that if we just saw the quantitative data. But by looking at or listening to, this, in this case, the unsolicited utterances, and then later on looking at other types of questions we then added to, the, to this, we are able to get a better picture of what's going on. And I think it's a tribute to Professor Adamczyk that her book really beautifully marries these things together. So, so to just very briefly talk about what now? Um, what, what can we do? What other topics should we, can we be looking at beyond the general view regarding just the, the, you know, the quote, morality or justifiability of LGBT, LGBT relations. And Professor Damsik started talking about it. I want to mention a couple. Uh, I mentioned a couple because I'm doing work on them, so it's a plug for me too. Uh, the first one is the question of same-sex parenting. Professor Damsik mentioned the issue in Taiwan. The question, how do you, you know, what about societies that are very children oriented that still have this notion of biological children in a father-mother household? This is a really important question and, you know, I've been studying this question, collecting data on it, but there's also some international data on it. Um, where is this? So one thing uh, my, t you know, two professors and I have been looking at has been looking at people's views regarding that issue. And we asked, this, the question that was asked, and this is a data set not unlike the World Value Survey. Um, this is done, uh, but this is the International Social Survey Program. And the question was, children grow up in different kinds of family. To what extent do you agree or disagree to the following statements? And the first one was, a same-sex female couple can bring up a child as well as a male-female couple. And then they asked the same question about a same-sex male couple. But they also asked the question about single parents. Because, and, and I think it's important to think about the comparison. And the reason the comparison, I think, is important is so much of the debate about same-sex parenting's idea, well, you don't have a father and a mother. Well, in a same-sex household, in a, in a single-parent household, you may have the same issues. So we wanted to know what were the views on it and how does it vary internationally. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, uh, and these are countries, it's 36 countries. It unfortunately underrepresents the many of the countries that uh, Professor Damsek demonstrates very carefully, you know, very persuasively that we should be looking at. There's only one African country, for example, in this group. But just to put you in terms of the hierarchy, the United States is actually fairly liberal regarding same-sex mothers. And the pattern for same-sex fathers is about the same. People are a little less supportive of same-sex fathers and same-sex mothers, but it's not a huge difference. This is where the United States is. If you look at the red, this is where Scandinavian countries are and, you know, we're talking about wealthy countries, countries that have one particular religion, Protestant religion, so it's not the mixed Protestant religion, so it's going to be fairly liberal along the way. If you add other European wealthy countries, you see, again, in terms of same-sex parents, it's pretty liberal. Regarding single parents, it's much more varied along the way. If you look at that purple is not very good up there. Can you see it? So this, if you see the purples, and they're towards the bottom in general, these are, uh, these are Eastern European countries. And I do think this is one area that I, I assume that Professor Damsik is going to be focusing even more on, because this is one of the locations that has been one of the battles over same-sex relations. Uh, and it is one of the areas in which the United States, many lobbyists or advocacy groups from the Christian right have been really emphasizing their outreach to. Um, I just want to mention a couple of interesting patterns. It's like Philippines actually has a pretty liberal view regarding single parenthood, and Mexico as well. 
And I was trying to make some sense of it. And it absolutely makes sense if you think about the patterns, in, uh, the patterns of migration in which people, one member of the family moves to a country, sends funds back, gives remittances back to their family. Basically, it's sort of like this notion that single parent, at least single parent in terms of residential single parent, would work together. I, I just wanted to mention those patterns. Let's, let's get that. Let's get that. Um, but I wanted to mention those patterns because this is just one illustration of how you can take Professor Damsik's work and extend it to other areas. A few other ones I briefly want to mention. The debate about religious freedom is a big one, and I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if Ryan mentions that uh, in, in his talk. But the claim of, quote, religious freedom as a counterpoint to LGBT rights is going to be an ongoing discussion both in the United States and worldwide. Similarly, the questions regarding gender identity, I think, is going to continue to you know, be expanding. And in this case, the United States may be behind at least some countries in some ways regarding that. And finally, as a plug for my own work, notions of what family is, is another one that will vary, that will be very important to ver look across, across, uh, across countries. One thing, for example, we know that in the United States, People have this idea that if you are married or you have a child, you are a family. Turns out that in other countries, marriage is nothing. It is all about having children. So we collected data in Germany. If you are married and you don't have a child, you are not a family. Pattern was also replicated in Israel. So the point is, these are all areas in which there can be some really important changes, uh, 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 important agenda for future research internationally. I have a feeling I've gone past or through my 20 minutes. Yep, I'm done. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so I first wanted to say thanks to John Jay for organizing this event and giving me the chance to, to give some comments on the book. Um, and thanks to Professor Damzik for um, writing such a thoughtful analysis. Um, as someone who works on these issues both academically and in an activist uh, capacity, um, it was interesting to sort of read the book um, wearing those two hats and thinking about um, you know, what does this mean as like a scholarly work, but also um, what does it mean for doing um, LGBT rights work internationally? Um, and I want to give um, some thoughts sort of wearing each of those two hats. Um, so academically, um, so I have to admit that I am one of the researchers that Dr. Powell alluded to. Like I, I just do ethnography, I just do interviewing, I'm completely allergic to math, um, and, and that's sort of my, my methodological approach. Um, so I'm always really n nervous about commenting on books that have a lot of quantitative data um, because I, I'm scared that my reaction will be like, I wish you had done more interviews. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about this book is that um, I didn't have that reaction. Um, this is not damning with faint praise, but I think that this book is um, very mindful of the, the limitations of quantitative data um, and very thoughtful about the kind of um, other approaches that can be used to sort of flesh out some of the, the patterns um, that emerge internationally. Um, there's discussions of history, political economy, um, and, and moral and religious norms that really illuminate the particular ways that attitudes around sexuality unfold in practice. And I think that that's, that's a very helpful intervention. Um, one of the ways that I think that the book is attentive to this is thinking about um, you know, what can be captured in the kind of questions that the World Values Survey asks um, and what sort of exceeds the capacity of, of survey data. Um, so the data from the World Values Survey um, and the, the questions that are um, in parts of this book are um, you know, whether homosexuality is ever justified um, and whether respondents would object to having a homosexual neighbor. Um, and I think that uh, you, know, you can look at polling in different countries that, that really illustrates how um, questions about sex and sexuality are very, very slippery. Um, if you look at the US, um, Gallup began polling around some of these questions in 1977, but in 1982, 59% um, of respondents said that homosexuals should have equal rights in terms of job opportunities. So that's like, good. Um, but only 34% at the time said that homosexuality was an acceptable lifestyle. Um, so you have people drawing this distinction between the rights that people should receive and whether they're sort of can morally get behind the idea of, of being gay. 
Um, similarly, in 1992, um, Gallup found that 82% of respondents said that um, they're fine with gay people being hired as salespeople. Um, half that amount, 41%, said that they'd be okay with gay people being elementary school teachers. There's these kind of moral distinctions that get drawn around issues of sex and sexuality um, that may be difficult to kind of parse out in, in purely quantitative data. Um, you see this in France as well, where you know there's few qualms about like gay men shacking up together, but when you get to the questions of marriage and adoption, there was a surprisingly strong backlash um, in terms of like a, a, a social movement around children having a mother and a father. Um, and I think particularly for data on trans issues, there's a real need for, for better quantitative instruments internationally, um, and even in the US, thinking about um, the availability of data on trans lives versus LGB lives. Um, second, I think that the book challenges us to question taken for granted assumptions about culture and homophobia in a way that I think even really good qualitative research often struggles to do. Um, and I think that the mixed methods that Professor Adamczyk uses really draws that out in a powerful way. Um, one example that really stood out to me was um, the discussion of how traits that are often associated with Confucian cultures and the popular imagination actually pull in practice. Um, you know, the book does a remarkable job of charting how people in Confucian nations um, actually don't differ that meaningfully from um, other residents of other countries in things like you know, whether you value behaving properly, conforming to gender roles, being obedient, uh, or making your parents proud, where things like uh, cultural attitudes around divorce do kind of have a, have a meaningful impact. I think that often going into qualitative research, you sort of enter with these cultural norms in mind, and the, the ability to sort of suss this out with quantitative data um, just makes for a much richer analysis. Um, another example that I think is very helpful is the polling data from Russia and other contexts that I would perceive as, as difficult contexts to do LGBT rights work, um, where work on queer sex and sexuality is often seen as, as very difficult or impossible. Um, and here, you know, there, there are elements um, in uh, even somewhat hostile countries where, where people are somewhat receptive to, to LGBT rights arguments. Um, and I think if you look at some of the trend lines in the book, you know, it, it's notable that over the course of um, 10 years um, in the World Value Survey data, um, the percentage of residents who say that homosexuality is never justified drops from like 93% to 63% in Algeria, 96% um, to 73% in Pakistan, um, and then also rises in some countries in ways that I think are, are kind of instructive. Um, third and relatedly, I think that the model that the book develops is a really flexible and dynamic model. Um, and I think it has lasting utility beyond the examples of the book. Like it has great explanatory power with the examples in the book, but I also think that it, it has applicability beyond that. Um, and the model that the book develops where religious belief, economic development, and democratic governance create better or worse conditions for acceptance of homosexuality, um, I think is useful in challenging this narrative that there are some places that are just the worst place in the world to be gay. Um, and this is like one of my pet peeve framings in, in newspapers is like, is Uganda the worst place in the world to be gay? Um, and there's like a dozen worst places in the world to be gay. Um, I think that replacing that with a more dynamic understanding of how you know things like the intensity of religious belief, like democratic governance, like economic development, can um, either move ahead or backwards on acceptance of, of LGBT rights um, is a much more um, realistic and helpful way of, of thinking about some of these issues. Um, so I think that you know the discussion of religious and, religion and democracy. Um, and that kind of model in the book is helpful in thinking about how, you know, in the last wave of World Values Surveys data, a lot of Catholic countries saw a slight uptick in disapproval of homosexuality. And I'm thinking of um, Brazil, Germany, Mexico, and Slovenia, um, in a way that kind of coincides with some of the debates around marriage equality and the sort of push um, around gender ideology that you see coming up in a lot of Latin American and European countries. Um, Conversely, I think that the book also gives us a framework for talking about changes in the political climate and how these might or might not shape attitudes. Um, so one of those that immediately sprang to mind while reading the book um, was the worsening climate in Indonesia, which Human Rights Watch has done a lot of research around. Um, there's been a surge in anti-LGBT animus, um, harsh criticism by public officials, um, and now some draft penal uh, provisions that would criminalize same-sex activity um, in a country where it has not been criminalized um, you know, in recent memory. 
Um, another is in Brazil, where the rise of evangelicals is changing a lot of the debates um, around reproductive rights and LGBT rights, including um, a pending total ban on abortion, which would go further beyond the restrictions on abortion that currently exist. Um, in some ways, you know, these, these happen, these, these sort of crises from a rights perspective happened after the book was researched and written, but the model that's developed in the book fully applies to, to the way that these are unfolding. Um, when we think about how, you know, the limitations on democratic governance in Brazil with a kind of coup that happened um, around Dilma Rousseff's government, when we think about Indonesia and the, the restrictions on civil liberties with the introduction of Sharia law in Aceh, um, you know, these are, these are developments that fully fit within the kind of capacious analysis that's developed in the book. Um, and I think that having this model in mind makes it easier um, to sort of understand these political transitions as they happen and what the potential threats might be to sexual rights as some of these things unfold. So that's sort of the, the academic hat. Um, as someone who looks at the practice of human rights advocacy, um, there's a couple of dynamics in the book that I think are really fruitful in thinking about human rights research on, on these topics. Um, one of them that comes out in the book is the role of history, memory, and a culture of human rights um, in protecting sexual rights. Um, so it strikes me that a lot of the countries that are looked at in the case studies that do have strong protections for LGBT people have, have gone through pretty seismic shifts in their politics in a much more rights-respecting direction. Um, and that that can change their sort of openness to LGBT rights in really profound ways. Um, Professor Damsig points this out in the book when she talks about attitudes toward LGBT rights in Taiwan, where the transition to democracy creates an opening for LGBT organizations, more discussions in the media, more visibility of the issue. Um, and in some cases, this extends to the actual rights that are, that are sort of provided. Um, I think South Africa is probably the most powerful example of that, where you know, constitutional protection for sexual orientation directly emerged from the kind of post-apartheid moment um, and the embrace of a wide range of human rights by the African National Congress. Um, I think that you, know, you can think of Rwanda standing up at the United Nations a couple years ago saying, we support LGBT rights because you know, we have seen what can happen when like, hate flourishes in a society. You know, what happened in Rwanda is obviously very different from discrimination based on sexual orientation, but um, what the country had gone through sort of informs the stance that it takes on, on this somewhat um, controversial issue. Um, a second factor that I think is interesting is the transnational interplay that sort of goes beyond domestic public opinion and thinks about how these countries interact. And there's some of this in the book as well. Um, you know, you can think of how Taiwan embraces human rights in part as a response to, um, to China and to differentiate itself from authoritarian rule in China. Um, you can think about how Russia's rejection of human rights is a sort of counterpoint to what it sees as um, sort of liberal excess in the West. Um, you can also see it sort of used in controversial ways. Um, a lot of LGBT advocates have been critical of Israel's use of LGBT rights to sort of say, you know, like, compared to other countries in the Middle East, we are a very progressive democracy. Um, or you can think about um, you know, how uh, the use of um, aid conditionality is also like a, a debate where public opinion in one society influences uh, sort of the pressure that is leveraged against other countries. Um, as the book points out, uh, this I think becomes a, a bigger phenomenon in, in public opinion as we like live in a more globalized world. And the, the example in the book that I'm thinking of is the um, demand for marriage equality globally. Um, you know, as marriage equality developed in the United States, you know, it is in 2005, two years after the Goodrich decision in Massachusetts, that Uganda constitutionally bans same-sex marriage. I don't know that that was in response to a demand by Ugandan activists. I think it was more a sort of transnational response to same-sex marriage emerging in the US and in other countries. Um, and in addition to these kind of bilateral relationships, I think that there's um, other useful instances that are maybe a little more hopeful about how um, transnational bodies are, are furthering LGBT rights and advancing um, pro-LGBT public opinion. Um, the African Commission in 2014 issued its first resolution uh, expressing concern about violence and human rights 
violations against LGBT people because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, in December, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights issued an opinion saying that member states in the uh, American system um, should implement same-sex marriage and kind of have to implement same-sex marriage. Um, in the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence, you see um, what's called regional consensus used as a measure of whether countries should adopt certain policies and whether the European Convention on Human Rights compels them to adopt um, certain stances. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you can also look at the international level. Um, the World Health Organization in 1992 depathologized homosexuality as a mental illness. That gave cover to um, psychiatric bodies in places like Lebanon to adopt sort of pro-LGBT policies. Um, you can think of the words work of UN AIDS in sort of combating criminalization of homosexuality and saying that that's important for an effective HIV response. Um, but whether through this bilateral engagement, regional mechanisms, international pressure, um, I think it's, it's also interesting how um, public opinion sort of spills over from these domestic contexts and, and influences opinion in other countries in interesting ways. And finally, I think that the book is really helpful in thinking about where there might be fertile ground for human rights interventions. Um, and the World Value Survey data is part of that. Um, it's helpful to know where public opinion is maybe out of sync with the laws that are in place um, and where there's fertile ground for activists to sort of demand um, LGBT rights. But I also think it's important to know where public opinion maybe isn't favorable and um, there are pro-LGBT laws that might be vulnerable to sort of popular backlash. Um, I think Indonesia is a very good example of that where um, you know, criminalization was not in place, but public opinion is very hostile to, to LGBT rights. Um, Romania is another example where, you know, Romania has some protections, but um, the, like, public opinion has not been especially favorable, and now there's a um, constitutional amendment that's been proposed to ban same-sex marriage. Um, Kim Davis, like, did a little tour of Romania to sort of um, pitched the idea that uh, same-sex marriage was a threat to religious freedom. Um, but I also think that it's helpful to, to conceptualize public opinion in thinking what um, effective interventions might look like, um, and particularly like the model of the book in thinking about what um, an effective intervention might look like. Um, in some places, there might be utility in approaching restrictions on sexuality broadly. Um, so thinking not just about sexual orientation, but thinking about how that fits into a moral fabric around um, divorce, contraception, abortion, women's rights, things like that. Um, I think that that's played out in places like Malta or Ireland or the Philippines where discussions about same-sex marriage and legal gender recognition have played out alongside national debates around abortion, divorce, and other kind of family law um, type issues. Um, and each of the three avenues that the book identifies as an engine of public opinion change I think is relevant in this regard. Um, if you consider religion, uh, when we think about religion having effects at a societal level and not just at the level of individual belief, um, it becomes relevant to engage religious leaders and to find common ground. Um, this is something that LGBT activists did um, privately with the Vatican years ago, encouraging the Vatican to speak out against um, violence against LGBT people, which it did at the United Nations. Um, you can think about economics and the way that, uh, you know, the, the book highlights how um, in many societies uh, where LGBT people are seen as sort of individual and separate from the family context, there's maybe more room for LGBT rights. Um, I think it's unlikely that LGBT advocates are going to change like the GDP of Mauritania, for instance. Um, but one way that that does provide sort of an inroads into um, advocacy is thinking about how do we sort of reclaim homosexuality and, and LGBT people as part of the communal fabric. <laughs> Um, and in the Philippines, um, some of the past research and fieldwork I've done in the Philippines um, highlights how um, there is a different understanding of the LGBT individual's role in the family as the person who provides from the parents when their siblings get older or pay the school fees for their nieces and nephews. Um, that, that kind of um, rich understanding of what it means to be um, LGBTQ in a, in a society, I think can be helpful in sort of addressing some of the, the economic development type arguments um, that can have adverse effects on public opinion. Um, and then finally, to, to sort of conclude, I think that there's a really powerful argument um, that runs throughout the book about the importance of 
um, democracy and democratic institutions in advancing LGBT rights. And I think that this is something that um, in my work in the United States uh, has been much more apparent, I think, even at the, the level of individual states when, when doing LGBT advocacy. If you think about what effective responses were to the bathroom bill in North Carolina, um, a large part of it was the Moral Mondays movement where um, progressive citizens in North Carolina banded together not only against the bathroom bill but also against um, restrictions on voting rights, restrictions on access to abortion, um, you know, sort of socioeconomic policies that were advanced by the right and cut the, the um, social welfare net. Um, in Texas, One Texas Resistance adopted a similar strategy during the last um, summer special session of the legislature where um, progressive groups across the spectrum sort of banded together and found common cause um, and made a point of not throwing each other under the bus to sort of stand up against um, an overwhelmingly conservative legislative agenda. Um, and I think internationally, um, at a time of increasing authoritarian populism, it becomes more and more important for LGBT advocates to say um, it is important for us to protect democratic institutions and the human rights of everyone more broadly. Um, and I think the book does a very good job of spelling out why that's the case and why um, LGBT rights are so inextricably tied to the rise and fall of democracy more generally. Um, and so with that, I think we're opening it up to, to questions. Um, but thank you. We do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, congratulations to my colleague. Um, I am going to purchase a copy of your book. I think it's important to have, um, especially in the fact that I teach a human rights course here. So I, I think it would, I would be remiss to my duties to not have that book. As an African-American, I'm very interested in um, whether you've done some research in African-American community uh, in terms of their attitudes about uh, ex being accepting of uh, homosexuality. I don't say this to be egotistical or to make myself seem great, but I'm the leper in my family because I advocate for LGBTQ people, and uh, most of my family members are um, they're Christians and born-again Christians, so um, they have problems with me. And so I'm really interested in whether you um, see any changes. Is there any hope on the horizon, horizon or what? Yeah. yeah Hello. Okay. Uh, f uh, thank you so much for your question. That's that's actually a really good, really smart question. Um, and I'm going to answer it. I just want to give a heads up. If there's anybody here who doesn't have a raffle ticket, Bosco is is willing to come to you. <laughs> and give you one. And same with, I know some students have to leave. Make sure Bosco um, gets your name if you're in Michelle Holder's class. So back uh, to your specific question, that is a fascinating topic. And uh, along with two of my graduate students, we looked at um, views about LGBTQs amongst African Americans, and specifically if there was anything about the African American community, um, there has been some research at points, and I think this is what you're referring to, that would say or suggest that there's something about um, are African Americans more opposed to LGBTQs, or is there something going on in the community? What we found is that if we account for religion, African Americans are actually much more liberal um, than other people. But there's something going on with religion. And as we know, in Americans, conservative Protestants tend to be particularly opposed to LGBTQs, and African Americans are disproportionately a part of those organizations and groups. Um, our research did not find anything unique about living in an African American community, a community with a high proportion of African Americans, nothing like that. There's not a culture like that. It is what you're probably thinking it is, which is, it's the religion that is um, really affecting people. At the same time, I think there's hope within these groups. I think we need to think about how to frame those messages. Um, and uh, I, I would be happy to share with you um, the research that we, we were able to do. We published it last year uh, that I, I hope can try to unravel some of these questions because that is a burning question for so many Americans who do this research and um, just for individuals who are living in America who are curious about these questions. Thank you. Let me just add a little 
I, I want to just add a little thing to that. Um, first thing is there is actually reason for hope. Uh, the difference, the black-white difference in views regarding LGBT relations has been reducing over time. So there has been a change on that. The other th issue is there are different types of questions you can ask. So if you asked, for example, do you believe that people should deny service to a same-sex couple for religious reasons? Or just do you think people should, businesses should be allowed to deny service? The African-American community actually on average is much more opposed to that. So, you know, so in that case, there seems to be this conflict between their views regarding the morality of LGBT relations and their views about fairness and treatment of people. So, it's, it's, so in certain areas, uh, the, you know, African Americans are more liberal regarding some issues regarding LGBT. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for anyone, really. I don't know if you know Joseph Massad from Columbia University. He worked on uh, something called the Gay International and Reorienting Arab Desire. So I just kind of want to like expand upon like some of the notions of uh, the imposition of the strict conservatism in countries such as Africa and the Middle East. Do you take some sort of uh, self-reflective approach in that respect, because I mean, uh, you showed a graph that said uh, chart was Christianity more liberal than Muslim, and I just want to understand how did that um, particular chart come about? Uh, did you base it on a progressive attitudes within the, a predominantly Christian or Muslim country, or is it just like a generalization to uh, for each ideology? Sure. Um, so, so what are you referring to? What I presented? Yeah, earlier? the, the okay, graph okay. that you presented earlier. Yeah, yeah. So that is the um, the contextual influence of living in a nation that tends to be dominated by a particular faith, and so that that was um, created by simply looking at the pro the dominant religion within a country based on the proportion of people who adhered to a given religion. And so, what I find, and I unpack this a lot more in the book, is that um, there aren't st st in some way statistically inclined colleagues can affirm this, but there aren't any statistically significant differences between um, uh, Muslim nations, Christian Orthodox nations, and um, uh, mixed Protestants. What mixed Protestants means where we have this mixture of both conservative Protestantism as well as these liberal Protestant groups. Amongst those three groups, they actually can be kind of grouped together, which is sort of fascinating. Where there are these big differences is when you start to look at the difference between um, majority Muslim countries versus Catholic nations, or majority Muslim nations versus mainline Protestants. Protestant nations. The mainline Protestant nations often tend to cluster in Europe. These are really liberal places in general. So that's kind of how that is um, put together. And then within the book, I, I unpack a lot more about religion and um, what are personal religious effects as opposed to what is a country contextual effect. And I hope that you can win this raffle. And Yeah, I mean, w one of the pieces that I think speaks to that is if people inherited the laws from um, British colonialism with regards to uh, sexual relationships. And if they did, there certainly seems to be some influence that has remained there when these nations got their freedom. They often took the laws that they already had um, that they didn't mind not changing, and then that just went on. So I think that's one representation of where uh, that can come in. Uh, it's a complicated um, question. Um, uh, related to this because some people will say, um, you know, same-sex relations is coming from the outside and others will say, no, this was always a part of us and there's a lot of debate amongst politicians and scholars and so forth. Um, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm, I'm wondering if I should uh, maybe speed things up. Is that... Hi, um, so my question is, so as we know in many countries, their opposition homosexual often, not always, have to do with religion, whichever religion they practice in their country. Um, we do see that uh, there are cases where it's not necessarily like that, such as in East Asian countries, um, just from like a traditional Confucianism. I do wonder, have, have in any of your research, have you found any uh, other country or culture that also um, 
has traces to this anti-homosexuality stance that not necessarily have to do with religion, kind of um, connected to the question you brought with colonialism, because it is true that there are also countries where they were not necessarily, they were anti-gay or they were apathetic to it until, you know, say Christianity was brought to all other religion. So I was wondering, um, and, and I'm bringing it up because there have, there is this notion, kind of like what we said about the outsider bringing in, the notion that being gay is a quote unquote Western thing, or, uh, and which <laughs> frustrates me every time because it's not just white people can be gay, obviously, there are gay people can be found in Asia, Africa, other continents, all recorded in history, except they wasn't conceptualized as gay. That's more later on social identity. So um, I guess just want to see how much truth or lies there is in the idea that um, that there was anti-homosexuality prior to, I guess, European colonialism, or that wasn't really a thing until afterwards. You get one of yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, these, these are complicated uh, questions. And certainly my book is interested in kind of where does this these views come from? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's complicated, like how much of this stuff is being imported versus how much of it isn't being imported. And Uganda is an interesting case. I really look to see how attitudes changed after Scott Lively went there. Scott Lively was an evangelical from the United States who went there and uh, talked with legislatures and tried to change things. And I have to say, they were already really opposed to LGBT cues a long time ago. But at the same time, I don't think we're asking the right questions. Um, I think, uh, um, it, you know, if you were to phrase it in a different way or you were to uh, talk about this from a different perspective, I think we would have a lot more information. But then we're constantly being constrained by that damn survey data, which is so incredibly frustrating. And we can't change those questions a lot of times once we've already started to ask them. So, um, I, yeah, it's, I, th I think there's some good questions here about wh what exactly is going on and what, what can kind of be unpacked or not and so forth. So thank you. So uh, I'm afraid we are out of time here. Uh, and I know some students probably have classes to get to. So um, if we can give our uh, presenters and discussants one more round of applause.